Okay, I think we can go ahead and begin. Yeah, so first of all, thanks everyone for coming today uh, to our careers in neuroscience panel. And uh, we hope you guys all learn a lot about um, how to pursue some careers in neuroscience and also hear from our amazing guest speakers today. So once again, if you just joined, this meeting will be recorded and possibly uploaded to YouTube. So if you would not like to be seen, then please turn off your camera and mute yourself. All right, so first of all, just for a brief schedule of today's um, event. So we'll start off with some introductions of the organizations, IYNA and Helix. And then uh, each speaker, Dr. Jin and Dr. Narayanan, will do their presentations on their careers. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session uh, with some questions you guys submitted on our sign-up form. And if you have any questions that come up during the course of the event, you can also private message me in the chat. And then we'll have some contact info of the organizations at the end so you guys can reach out. Okay, so first, um, this event is hosted by the Helix Initiative and IYNA USA. So the Helix Initiative aims to guide students that want to further pursue their science interests by creating research and STEM opportunities for high school students, providing widespread STEM curriculum, and creating a welcoming community for students interested in STEM to connect. Past initiatives have include hackathons, we actually have one this December, STEM tutoring, and science-related blog postings. Additionally, we have over 2,600 members in 40 different countries. Um, if you would like to learn more about us, visit helix.science, and you will be able to join our Discord and take part in the Helix Initiative. And then the second organization also hosting this event today is the IYNA or International Youth Neuroscience Association. So in general, the IYNA is a youth-led nonprofit that's led to uh, that's dedicated to inspiring the next generation of neuroscientists. And um, the IYNA USA is the USA National Chapter Network, and it um, consists of all the IYNA chapters in the U.S. And we host lots of events such as like webinars, speaker events, panels, and interchapter events. And we'll have our contact info listed at the end of this slideshow too, if you want to contact us. Okay, so now let's go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker, or one of our speakers today is Dr. Ishi Jin, and she received her BS degree from Peking University, China, and her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. She then completed her postdoctoral training at MIT. And currently she is a junior Seoul Foundation endowed train chair in traumatic brain injury and distinguished professor at UCSD. So Dr. Ishi Jin is a really qualified and a great speaker and I can't wait to hear more about her research and why she chose a career in neuroscience. Thanks Sarah. So what do I do now? <laughs> I think you might have to make me a host so that um, I could share is that the idea. Um, we're going to um, go ahead and learn more about our, wait, okay, yeah, you can go ahead and share your screen. Yeah, so, oh, good, so I can, yes, I do see my screen, see if that, does that work? Yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, so, um, hi, everyone, I guess um, there's a rule, when I mean, there is a advice, you don't have to show your face, and, um, but I do like to know all of you, and first of all, I want to thank um, Sarah for the invitation and to come to speak with you. And it's really exciting because I actually do not know that uh, all of you are organized into um, very lively events. I check on the website and I'm very impressed by what you're doing. Um, it reminds me many, many years ago, of course, many, not can, it, depending on how you actually counting the years, and I was at your age. Um, so I wanted to um, talk to you, as Sarah says, anything I want to talk about, I, I thought I'll start um, basically as a, more like a conversation and to uh, share with you the journey I became a neurogeneticist and now a professor at UCSD. I am in uh, neurobiology and that is for some of you probably have um, a local, if you're local, you probably came come to UCSD, um, which is the background that you see, the virtual background. 
in the Revolt College, and that is where the biological sciences are. And my building is very much close to the main gym. All right, so I'll start quickly. Um, many years ago, I um, was a high school student, and um, I became interested in science, actually, more or less uh, under a, the great influence of a biology teacher in my high school. Because I started really was interested in history and um, particularly interested in writing uh, fictions, um, wanting to become a writer. But this biology um, teacher uh, who really taught us about um, every life has their um, feelings and I could feel the energy she put in, in, in educating us. And she made me thinking that the trees can speak to me. So that's when I start became fascinated about science and begin to learn um, biology. Um, I share with you, this is actually a quite old photo. And that's where it's my whole class of um, uh, college in Peking University. And this is all biological students. And the front, the second row are the professors. It was in um, Peking University, I began specialized, started interested in cell biology. And so that's where um, I obtained a degree, majored in cell biology. Following graduation, um, I had a fortune to um, get selected to study abroad. And I came to UC Berkeley, as I already mentioned, that's where I conducted my PhD, not far from where we are. Um, I actually entered in a degree called molecular biology. It's nothing to do with neuroscience. However, in, in many ways, is what I wanted to tell you is that it's great to fix your ideas. You wanted to be specialized in neuroscience or cancer biology or um, cell biology. Along the way, it's all about you wanted to learn um, the logic of doing science. So I studied, conducted my PhD uh, thesis under Professor Catherine Anderson. And she actually introduced me to very early on. The first model organism that I knew about is the fruit fly, Drosophila. Um, particularly, I learned about um, mechanisms that uh, determine the differences between dorsal, ventral, which basically means um, back and, and front. Um, so don't know how many of you actually worked with flies. Um, flies are fabulous. You find them everywhere. And flies actually is the first um, model organism in the lab setting up genetics as a research organism. I'm sure you have heard the stories about um, white eye fly that called um, by accident um, came into Thomas Morgan's lab uh, in New York City. You might also heard um, the four wind fly. Normally there's only one pair of wind. This four wind fly is actually what set up uh, studies of homeotic, um, home transcription program. So what I did, my thesis research, is to study this embryos, uh, fly embryos. Um, they have differences between, you can see the dorsal and the ventral, and ventral is curved. This embryo within 24 hours will become a crawling larvae, and it's uh, with a pattern that's very different from the dorsal side versus the ventral side. And this is where you flip them over, the ventral side becomes so-called ventral denticles, which helps larvae to crawl on plates. Um, at the time, I became interested um, doing my um, PhD study. My PhD thesis advisor was involved in isolating genetic mutants um, in displaying differences in this dorsal ventral pattern formation. So here you can see a mutant are very different from the wild type is that it doesn't have those um, bright bands and this embryos is a mutant dye and we call them dorsalized because it's full of um, dorsal cuticles. Whereas this embryo, it's also quite ugly and they die, but you can see expanded ventral denticles everywhere. This is called ventralized. 
This turned out to be um, the two different embryos is the result of disruption of a single gene. One is a loss of function of a gene called the toe, and uh, one is actually what they call the dominant or gain of function mutation in the same gene that's called toe. So essentially, what I explained to you is that different mutations in the same gene can alter the protein function differently, and then alter the pattern of development. And the discovery of this gene called TOL from Drosophila, which has nothing to do with our human appear to be, but actually provided the groundwork for the discovery of toll like receptors that all of us have. And those toll like receptors are key proteins that's involved in sensing pathogens, foreign objects, and in the response where evolution can serve called inner immunity. So I conduct my thesis um, by studying just embryonic patterns of different mutants and contributed to understanding of toll mediated signal transduction pathway. And I received a PhD in molecular biology. Generally, after your PhD, um, you would take a, a several years and to uh, conduct the so-called postdoctor training. In this phase, you begin to develop your own um, independent research program. So I moved from uh, West Coast and to East Coast and at MIT, joined the lab, uh, Bob Horvitz, which you show a second. There, I began to study um, neurogenetics, learning about neurogenetics. In an animal model, uh, it's called Cinerabodetis elegans, that is a nematode, as you see here, and you study them using microscope because they're very small, and they're only the largest ones, about a millimeter long. They're called worms, and they're not, um, they're free living worms, so that's why we say them is not non-parasitic worms. In the lab, they grow on um, petri plates and has bacteria, as you see here. And they were chosen as research um, organisms, I see a second, because they also have very rapid life cycle. And three days, they'll reproduce one generation, providing many advantages to generate the mutations and to uh, study genetics. It's the first genome, very small genome, and the first genome got entirely sequenced. Um, it has defined the chromosome map, and it's uh, living normally as a self-fertilizing hermaphrodite, which means they can keep uh, mutations as homozygous. The best part of working with the C. elegans is that those worms survive um, cryo-freezing. So that is to say, they can revive any time from deep freeze. We can keep the mutation forever. Um, those, um, this organism, C. elegans, was selected um, as a laboratory organism by a man called Sidney Brenner. Um, he was a researcher in England um, wanting to study um, using a model organism to uh, deduce every single step to build an organism particularly um, in the nervous system and how neurons are uh, specified and form connections with the partners. And particularly, he wanted to use the techniques of genetic analysis. And he made this proposal to his um, unit director, Max Cruz, who's actually a structure biologist, obtained the funding to begin uh, his work. So the first work he did essentially is to feed the nematode with chemicals can modify DNA. Then he will look for any um, mutants or abnormalities in their progeny. So he defined them as a mutations. And this you can see here is that um, in here is a normal worm. In here is a fat, short worm, we call them dumpy. In here is a long and thin, we call them long. In here is a worm that's wiggly, so we call them uh, uncoordinated. So he had the privilege to be the first one to establish C. elegans as a genetic model organism. 
And um, through his work, then he um, performed, he recruited other researchers, which included Bob Porritz, who's my postdoc research mentor, and John Salston, who also is his colleague, established the developmental um, lineage of this C. elegans. And together, the three of them established the field and ultimately um, they received the Nobel Prize about 18 years ago for their discovery of the genetic regulation of organ development and the process leading to cell death. So what um, I conducted under Bob Corvus's lab is um, to learn about C. elegans genetics and identify um, mutants that affecting behavior. Um, through that work, uh, I then obtained the faculty position back to the west coast of California, eventually um, setting up my lab. I call the Neurogenetics Lab at UCSD, and there I've been doing research and education. So I'm going to, um, Sarah, if you can tell me uh, 10 minutes or five minutes, give me a time so that I don't go on forever because I love to talk about my work, but I also wanted to um, have a chance to talk with you. So um, in neurogenetics, and um, I think it's important that um, actually you all know, since you are uh, in the neuroscience society, is in our brain, um, the uh, fundamental unit that um, transmit information is a minute structure called a synapse. And the synapse basically is uh, delivering the signals and neurons sends to its partners and to trigger reactions. Uh, if it's consisted of a presynaptic or presynaptic terminal that have a lots and lots of um, vesicles that will show you a second, those will carry messengers and to transmit neurotransmitters and then the receiving end will have many, many molecules that will respond to them and to orchestrate the response. So what you see here is a bunch of um, gene names, protein names with different colors. And the particular colors is those the ones that um, labeled as red. Those are the ones that have become uh, implicated in neurological diseases particularly um, what we now know as autism spectral disorders. And they could be mutations reducing the protein expression or increased protein expression or changing protein function. So synapses is very important. Um, but my interest really is how then you build the synapse. That's where uh, my lab's focus. So if you zoom in to actually see the true structure, the cellular structure of the synapses, and you have to use electron microscope. And here is a vertebrate, um, a slice of vertebrate brain under electron microscope. You see the present terminal has all those little dots and there are called synaptic vesicles. And in C. elegans, and it's also, is a slice of the um, synapse transmission from neuron to muscles, you see the same thing. There are all those black dots. They are the vesicles which we can reconstruct them, as you see here. This is a presynaptic terminal, and those purple are synaptic vesicles, and those um, red ones is different type of vesicles they clustered very tightly um, opposing to the muscle cells of the postsynaptic neurons. So we're interested is how those vesicles all come together so organized um, to develop. And so here shows the vesicles are made of lipids and proteins. And here's a computer generated model to show that each of the small um, synaptic vesicles packed about 450 proteins of close to 100 different types. And so we wanted to know how synapses gets to the right place. This is where we developed ways to see those synapses um, in live organism, in this case, it's a live worm where I'm sure you all seen what don't know what ground fluorescent protein is, which is major discovery from UCSD um, former Professor Roger Chen's work. 
um, like kind of fluorescent in live cells, then if we fuse to a synaptic vesicle proteins, we can target green fluorescence to synaptic vesicles. Then we can make a transgenic worm expressing that marker, and then we can observe the synapse in vivo in living animals. With all of these tools, then we can use genetics and to look for genes that disrupt the synaptic formation. So this is what we call SID screen, is because we're searching for genes that's important for vesicles to cluster and to the right place. So I hope you can see, you've been all observing in the wild type, um, normal cases, those vesicles is a very dense clustered regular shape. Then we can find mutants that basically reduce the number, reduce the shape and changing um, the morphology. All of these genes and proteins, you do not need to know more. I listed here, you can look for references. Essentially, they are proteins actually localized to the presynaptic terminal to shape the membranes and shape the spatial um, structure to allow the vesicles to be trapped there and then organized in a way they can deliver the information. So that is one type of research my lab do is to find mechanisms to how those proteins will interact with each other to make synapses function efficiently. How I'm doing on time? I can't hear you. You have approximately six minutes left. Six minutes. Okay, so then I want to quickly track to another neurogenetics that I've been studying. This is related to axon regeneration and is a phenomenon that uh, may be related to, I know the next neurosurgeon may tell me a lot more I'll learn from her. Um, axons are, um, before the synapse are forming, they need to grow long distance, and so that synapse gets the right place. And when they get damaged, as this um, man, Ramoni Cajal, who did first very extensive series studies, when the brain gets damaged, axon gets um, transactioned or um, be cut apart, as the red arrow said here. The axons don't regenerate particularly, so which is why uh, recovery from um, spinal cord injury is very difficult, almost impossible. And partly it's because the axons don't have the ability and to reestablish connection. So we are interested in our laboratory organism and to study what is what are the factors actually uh, involved in responding to uh, damage to um, the axon. For this, we developed a way to use laser. Um, this is, sorry about this um, um, PowerPoint, keep going back and forth. We developed a laser injury method. As you see here, this is basically, is an axon that just got using laser, got cut right here and right here. And you see in the next few minutes, and those, um, some of the neurites will start um, elongating. And that is response to injury. However, this kind of uh, response generally is very futile. Eventually, those random growing axons will die and become this uh, death sign. Um, for us, then, we use um, this uh, laser injury methods to screen for molecules that will um, mediate um, injury response. One of them is a gene we call, we identified is a kinase called dulucine zipper kinase. And um, this is kind of a textbook illustration because it has a kinase domain. And this shows that it's a, a protein that's present in C. elegans, Drosophila as well, and a human. What we find is that uh, if we, so in the normal um, animal, and in responding to injury somewhere here, the axons will respond and initiate growth signs. However, if we delete, remove this gene in C. elegans, 
and those axons do not respond at all. If then we uh, increase this gene's expression level, we can see them grow a lot more. So this is a discovery of the kinase as a sensor for injury. And I wanted to say is through our work and in collaboration with others, now we know is that um, even in human DLK, this particular kinase is actually important for patients to recover from stroke-induced um, motor disability. So we've been doing a lot of this genetics uh, in the lab and in a way to model uh, human diseases. And um, the idea is uh, through studies of neurogenetics in fun understanding the fundamental mechanisms, we can provide insights that uh, for other researchers and doctors, um, pharmaceutical um, a, a genetic screen, uh, chemical screens to find the cures um, so that it can help human. What I wanted to um, introduce to you, this probably is the end, um, is this um, new project where it's um, related a syndrome called PAX1. So I hope, let me just stop sharing that and then share a different screen. Um, this is a project we recently started. Um, it's called PAX1 syndrome. Again, it's a genetically um, discovered from study children. The children basically exhibiting the babies uh, can be as early as a few months old. They will start uh, exhibiting seizures. And when um, Reedy's uh, Children's Hospital at, UC, at, the, at the San Diego is actually one major center contributed to uh, identify the genetic basis of this PAX1 syndrome. Uh, it turns out it to be a single nucleotide change and then resulting a single amino acid change from arginine to tryptophan. So those children do have a um, variety of um, neurological um, uh, disabilities. So currently we are establishing a C. elegans model by creating using CRISPR and Cas9 technology genome editing to generate a C. elegans that's actually containing this toxic amino acid. And for that, um, I think I could go back um, to share a screen back to what I started. Um, essentially to conclude is that in our lab, we use the tools um, to do basic research. We'll also um, explore many ways um, in undergrad education. So what you see here, uh, essentially, there are usually college students and a few high school students in the summer will come join us um, to study using C. elegans. And this is a artwork and demonstrates C. elegans. It has a hermaphrodites, the worms over there, and they will learn about how to analyze genetic mutants. We are strong advocates um, for science, and if you know about them, um, the walk, the science walk days. And we're also um, contributes to fundraising, such as this is one case we um, run for autism. Um, there's many activities. I welcome you to um, join our lab. And I want to thank my lab people. This is UCSD. And those are uh, generous people who contribute research funds and also um, resources. So I will just stop here. And um, I could answer questions. Actually, we could wait until Q&A session. Yes, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Dr. Jin. That was really interesting. I think you really explained it really well. So I'm a biology person, not a neuroscience person, but I was able to understand it really well. So thank you for that. Um, I think you guys can go ahead and put your questions in chat, but we will answer them at the end with the both speakers. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Jin. All right, I'll see you around, right? Yeah. Okay. So now Anisha will introduce our second speaker. Okay, so Dr. Nadayanan received her bachelor's degree at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and then she earned her medical degree at the University of Chicago. 
She went on to complete a surgery and neurosurgery residency through Harvard's Brigham and Women's Hospital or Boston Children's Hospital program in Boston, Massachusetts. Today, Dr. Narayanan is the chairman of surgery at the University of Maryland PG Trauma Center. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Malini Narayanan. I'm going to share my screen. Dr. Jin, that was a fantastic talk. And Anisha, thank you so much for the introduction and really the invitation. It's a real honor to talk to all of you, um, as I'm sure Dr. Jin felt as well, really the future of, of neuroscience. So it means a lot. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I won't have ghastly technical issues. Um, so just reintroducing, uh, I'm on the East Coast and I see that there's an East Coast, West Coast contingency uh, at this. And it's really exciting to be here. So while Dr. Jin is the basic scientist who's developing surgical ways on the cell to cure disease, I use surgical ways on the brain to help with disease. But I'm hoping Dr. Jin will find all molecular ways to cure a lot of the cancers that we see and uh, all the challenges that we see, including I wanted to follow up on the diffuse axonal injury, which Dr. Jin would know is in trauma um, and has a very long time. What happens is the axons do sever, there's retraction balls and injury, and it, it produces a very slow response in the patient to really come around and come out of consciousness. Um, and then of course, the spinal cord injury. Um, I went in a different, uh, you know, I really wanted to uh, hone in um, on kind of my path because I feel like a lot of the um, uh, knowledge base in terms of neurosurgery may be out there and we can follow that up. Um, and as Anisha had already said, and I'll put in the personal aspect, is I never planned to be a doctor um, and I never planned uh, to to be in the field that I'm in. I actually uh, loved math and physics and my dad was an engineer and it seemed so neat. You know, you can build things, they'll work really well to absolute precision. And um, it just seemed like a natural. As a matter of fact, I had an aversion and Dr. Jin and I are actually connected in a different way. That is my brother's autistic. And um, he was one in 10,000 uh, and diagnosed one of the first rounds at Boston Children's Hospital. And at that time, it was one in 10,000, uh, not one in 100. He was classic. He would rock when he was very young, long periods. So clinically, how does autism present? You know, he was uh, very inward. A lot of my friends would say, oh, you mean he's artistic? Does he paint really well? Does he? And I said, Actually, he is kind of artistic because he loves music, but he's more autistic, auto, he's inward, um, kind of like the extreme of intro introverted. And to the point where he would rock for hours when he was three years old, slightly hitting his head against the wall, touching him uh, would hurt. And he's written a couple of books now from having no speech, um, being very inward. Um, when he was, uh, my parents would work very hard at home and they would try different ways to break through. What does this child know? Is this child just a lump of skin and bones? Who is this child? You know, and at Boston Children's, they did an MRI. MRI is normal. That is an imaging of the brain. At that time, it was CT. Later on, it was MRI. Um, and we would often visit alternative doctors. One of the ones that was amazing was in New York City, Dr. Cobb. He was, one, he was in a high rise building in New York City. And in those days, this was 30 plus years ago, my parents would pay out of pocket $500, which would easily be about 2,000, 3,000 now. Um, and he was into diet with, and looking at diet for hyperactivity um, and started to give my brother vitamin C, which has a lot of controversy, um, you know, and different um, uh, nutrition um, supplements. And so really I was exposed to neuro 
since I was probably five years old, um, looking at the enigmas of the brain. Um, and uh, one day we put out two words. My mom would show two words. One would say cat and one would say ball, but he couldn't talk at all. This was around eight years old. And um, we said, oh, you know, she would say, can you point to ball? And she would point. He suddenly started to point to the correct word over and over and over again. So that was kind of one breakthrough. Another time was when my father would have my brother write just from a book around 12, all the paragraphs of like, you know, David Copperfield. Um, and he would just to practice the motor skill because he had very poor coordination. He couldn't really hold the glasses correctly. Holding the pen was very hard. You have to have your pincer grasp it, grasp it enough and coordinate through the cerebellum and through the prefrontal cortex and the motor cortex so that you can write. Um, and so he would practice. This is about neuroplasticity, right? Um, and so he would practice that. And one day, you know, instead of saying, um, you know, it's, he paraphrased a whole sentence. And that was our insight that he understood what he was writing. And after that, he started writing more sentences on his own, but he needed facilitated touch. So someone would have to just give him the backup from about 14 to 18 so that he could keep writing. And eventually that led to a few books. You know, one of them is Wasted Talent. And in it, he says, you know, I feel like I'm wasted talent because I'm trapped and I feel intense sensory that hurts so much when people touch me and it hurts. Um, and that kind of connects with peripheral neuropathy. Um, and, and he talked about how it felt when people would look at him differently. And that gets into neuroethics and neurodiversity. You know, is he different? as an autistic or is society different by not creating an environment that he can just thrive in? So what, are, what, what does it mean to be different, right? And what does it mean, you know, and that's a big question, racially speaking, right? Um, and so what does it mean to have neurodiversity? Um, and so, <clears throat> so when I, as a little kid growing up with that, I saw so many doctors help, help, you know, think of alternative ways um, to help my brother. But there was really no precise cure. He was getting better and better. His quality of life was getting better. When he was five, he couldn't chew food. And my mother would sit him on a dishwasher and have him practice chewing. So he couldn't eat, Anisha, any of the South Indian foods. He had to have everything liquid. So that took another few, a year or two. By the time he was five or six, he could start eating a few of the foods and increase his appetite. Now he eats just about everything. Um, so every single skill, I would watch my mother write 20, 30, you know, um, skill sets that he would have to get to get his quality of life better. She used to have stacks of journals of autism and schizophrenia in her bedroom studying it. You know, we talk about studying in a formal way, getting degrees, and then there's the informal way. Like there's a great movie called Lorenzo's Oil, where the parents are trying to find a cure for their child. So having grown up in that, I was like, well, medicine's not precise enough. There is no way I'm going to do medicine. I mean, I thank all the doctors that were there. Uh, but it's tough. You make a lot of big decisions. Like the Boston Children's Hospital specialist who diagnosed my brother said to my parents, probably rightly so. There's no hope. You're better off letting him be in an institution. It's going to take your whole life to try to give him any quality of life. Uh, there's just, we have no solutions. And that seemed like the toughest thing I could ever say to somebody. So when I went into undergrad, and the reason I want to share that story is, is how we change in our lives from 10, 15, certainly our bodies, our minds, 
to 20, to 25, to 30, to 35. And as you're changing, your career is changing and the decisions you might make are changing. So at that age, when I was 18, that was my view. And I, and, but I wanted to help in electrical engineering. And I started getting interested in bioengineering. So I designed a machine for spasticity um, and uh, then went into, and my decision to go into grad school was I loved learning. I loved discovery. I could totally be a lifetime student, no problem, um, because I just love it, you know, the, the high that we get from learning. Um, and so I wanted to go into uh, grad school. I applied got into Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and immediately I, I felt like, well, how can I help with engineering? So I still wanted to help, but I wanted to do it in a defined way with real answers, I, with real precision. So I got into a project in uh, ophthalmology, developing a retinal prosthesis. And I was in charge of doing biocompatibility of many materials. So the retinal prosthesis was a kickoff from the cochlear prosthesis that was so successful at Mass Eye and Ear. Um, and the idea was that in patients, see, the retina is an outpocketing of the brain. So the retina is a perfect uh, uh, neuronal system that is um, very accessible easy to study in a Petri dish. You can get all the data that you need almost like the brain, but you're using the retina because it's really an out, an out pocketing and an extension of the brain embryologically as well. And it's built backwards, right? The ganglion cells, when you look in, in my eye, the ganglion cells are the first layer you would see if this was the retina. Say these are, my fingers are each layer. And my thumb is pointing out, you know, with the eye. This is anterior, right, in front, and this is posterior. And anterior is the um, ganglion cells. And the most posterior layer is the photoreceptors. So in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, which is one of the leading um, uh, subcategories of macular degeneration, the photoreceptors degenerate and the ganglion cells are intact. Um, and so the idea was, can we stimulate these healthy ganglion cells in patients getting blind? Because only one layer is bad. Well, what about all these layers? Why can't, we, why can't we stimulate the ganglion cell, which immediately connects into the optic nerve and goes through the optic nerve canal and traces all the way back through the temporal parietal and occipital lobes. Why can't we, you know, why can't that happen? So that was the bigger picture. So this would be like the cochlear implant. And one of the challenges was to look at biocompatibility. So I developed an amplifying system and the amplifier system is part of the electrical engineering aspect with transistors, amplifiers, um, all connected in series and then a software filtering mechanism because there's too much noise when we recorded visually evoked potentials from the occipital lobe because you have movement noise, you have electrical noise. Actually, electrical noise is the number one noise. Um, and so you have to, what you have to do is the visually evoked potential when you shine a light has a characteristic signal, but the noise is random. So if you average a thousand signals, then the noise, which is random, will slowly drop down, but the typical signal will still stay at the same level. And so this way you can elicit that signal. So I would, I, that was my, actually, as I tell the story, this was my first foray into surgery because I had to put the screws in the rabbit in the posterior aspect of the head. And so um, we would go to the lab, we would go to the, the little veterinarian school, uh, you know, hospital on the MIT campus and um, work with a veterinarian and start putting the screws in the skull. And pretty soon he allowed us to do it in the lab um, where we had a little drill, little screw, and we would screw it in. 
So that was actually my first, in retrospect, that was my first beret. And actually that image is on the internet, but, but don't Google it. Um, and um, it's got me with a rabbit. Um, and so I would put those screws in, put the shine a light and measure it and measure biocompatible. We found most of the materials, which was silicon and biogels, pretty compatible. So that meant now we can actually start making the chip. When I finished that whole project, which was really fun, I had already done a lot of procedures, going to the OR, putting in little screws, taking care of the rabbit post-op. Um, you know, I'd have to go to the veterinary uh, little place where all the little rabbits would be, make sure they're okay. Um, you know, there was a, you know, they would look at our mortality and morbidity, make sure that our complications wasn't too high. Again, very similar as in a hospital where you're constantly looking at quality. Um, and, uh, and so at that point, I started to get more and more interested in medicine um, and started to get more and more interested in patients and probably evolved as a person. You know, I had been there now I had, this is almost eight or nine years later, I'm a different version of myself, right? When I entered in uh, undergrad, I was 18. And now I was, you know, 26. It's a different time, a different perspective. And now I was interested in medicine. And even then I was thinking, I'm going to be an ophthalmologist. It's perfect. I'll fit in, you know, I got this great research. I'm going to continue the research. I get to study the brain. Um, I have it all worked out. Um, let me just go to the, the next slide. So uh, again, undergrad, I was part of a society for responsible engineering. My personal story uh, exposed me to the mysteries of the brain, but it was latent. It was pushed back because it was personal. Um, and then uh, I went into the society for responsible engineering. And, you know, at that time, there's a little bit of controversy about military spending um, engineers were the front. I mean, uh, you know, now I, again, I feel differently. I feel that's really important. But at that time I was wondering what are some other ways I can help and started getting interested in bioengineering. For me, that was the answer rather than, um, perhaps getting more water to villages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I switched fields and, uh, here I am going along in med school. It was wonderful. First two years at university of Chicago was pass fail. So, so just let you know, if you guys are going to med school, it was first two years was pass fail. So that was heaven. Um, and it was important because here I was, my own brain was used to doing tons of math problems, tons of calculations, tons of really not a lot of discussion. You're in the library, you're doing all of your coursework, you might have some small study groups. You're then going to the lab. You may have one other person because it was a very small lab. I was the first uh, graduate student working on this project. And so it's a little quieter, a little less people. Suddenly you go into medicine. You're in a group of about 100 students, very social, um, lots of politics, um, you know, um, you know, met, you know, you're networking with other doctors who are also very social. And you're memorizing a ton. Um, so just my brain, my own brain wrapping around that was a big transition for me. I kept asking, well, why would you do it that way? Because in graduate school, you're encouraged to ask questions. You're encouraged to challenge. My, my professor would be like, well, do you agree? I mean, what's your counter argument? And you could argue and you, it wasn't a sign of disrespect. You go into medicine and maybe times have changed. It's very much about hierarchy. Um, it's very much about when your senior professor comes in, you're not necessarily going to ask, well, why do you take the temperature twice? Why not three times? It, it's a, and in medicine, it's kind of an irrelevant question because not everything has been put through a randomized trial to figure out you, you just can't spend that kind of time. People are sick. You got to take care of them. So you can't have this perfect scientific approach of justifying why you do what you do. Um, you end up developing your own, um, you know, your own way of doing things. But 
then there is a lot of science to it as well. The pharmacy, the pharmaceuticals, the anatomy, the cell biology, all of that uh, is there. So as I went to the third year, I started doing my rotations. I had a perfect CV for ophthalmology. Ophthalmology is really tough to get into. Got to have the perfect CV. It's like dermatology. Dermatology, ophthalmology, and ortho, for some reason, are super hard because great lifestyle. I don't know. Some people really like. um, And so the acceptance rate is very slow. So you really have to have the right, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, lead into it. But then I went into my third year and I rotated, you know, choosing, okay, well, you know, neurosurgery is close to ophthalmology, you know, brain makes a good fit. I'm going to do that as a rotation. It'll help my ophthalmology. And lo and behold, I run into this guy, Dr. David Frim. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon called Triple H because he did his undergrad at Harvard, PhD at Harvard, (laughs) and, and residency at Harvard. So he has the bow tie and everything, but so approachable such a kind, kind gentleman and um, very open, not snooty, doesn't make you feel like it's impossible to do this, encouraged me um, and still holds a very special place in my heart. Um, Always. I mean, he's still there at University of Chicago. I mean, there's some mentors you never want to let go of, but they let go of you because they know you've, you've gone beyond, you don't need them anymore and that he's one of them. You know, um, and, uh, you know, we would have these long conversations about research, this, that. He said, why don't you do neurosurgery? You know, and I was like, you know, and before he said that, I was already in love because I forgot to tell you another story, which is at MIT, I had our second graduate student on this team was doing medicine and he was gun ho sure he was going to do neurosurgery. He was like, mm, I'm doing neurosurgery. I was like, wow, how do you know that you're going to, and, and something happened to, I was like, that sounds so cool, you know, and, and I remember, cause I was already putting little screws in, in the skull and I just remember, he's so lucky, you know, but I, you know, it's just very quick, you know, this feeling, um, and his name is Dr. Dan DeLorenzo and he's out in California and I'm still in touch with him. Um, and so that kind of put the seeds And then I saw him and Dr. David Frim would let me operate on the brain. Here I was a med student. I mean, and he would let me hold the sucker. And, you know, if there was a blood clot, let me kind of, you know, graze over it. He let me open the dura, which is the outer covering of the brain. Um, So you have the scalp, the skull, you have the sutures, then you take the skull off. So the way you do brain surgery, is there are certain um, incisions that you make so that your scalp heals properly. And once you do that, you basically have a drill and you drill into the skull. And they're not Home Depot drills. They're actually very good drills, but they have a safety gap so you don't plunge. But you also have to learn how to feel it so that if the drill doesn't work right, you're not going to plunge the drill into the brain. Um, and it comes with feel and you can feel the outer table. It's really hard. And then you get into the inner table and it gets a little soft and you know, you've gotten in without, without rupturing the dura because what's right under the dura blood vessels. If you just drill, you can get a massive hematoma. So you have to be very careful. So you learn that in your second year of neurosurgery residency, then you connect the dots with what's called a craniotome. You pull it out. And you see the dura, and then you open the dura very gently because, again, if you poke your knife in, you can create a hematoma. So, what you do is you put a suture in the outer layer of the dura and you pull it up. It's almost like you see how I'm tenting out my cheek away from my teeth. It's the same thing. You're tenting out the dura, and then you make a little incision in the dura, and then you put a little instrument underneath, like a little right angle. It's called a right angle instrument. So, you hook it under the dura. So now you have an instrument that's protecting the brain, which is underneath my finger, against the dura, which is on top of the finger. And you cut over that dental. So you're protecting the brain. And then you go around. And he let me do that. And I got to see the brain. And I got to see the spinal cord. And I will tell you, I was in love. 
I, you know, I just absolutely love, I could not believe I'm looking at the brain. I also looked at uh, brain surgery that the patient was awake when they were having brain surgery. That was under Dr. Peter Black at Harvard. He had really developed that awake craniotomy for tumors that are in eloquent areas. So the patient would be talking. Hey, where are we? Oh, we're in the operating room. What day is it? Oh, it's February, you know, and their skull would be exposed, removed, their brain would be pulsating, and they're talking. They're telling me the children names. They're showing me two fingers. They'll even sing a song. And if we stimulate near the speech area, they'll stop. They were like, oh, no ifs, ands. Stop the stimulation. Thoughts. You know, um, you know, can you count to 10? Sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Okay. Now we're stimulating on the speech area. Can you, uh, we didn't stimulate. We just have the electrode, no current. Can you count one, two, three, four, stimulating? Stop stimulating. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I mean, that is how unbelievable that was. And it's still unbelievable to me. It still blows my brain, you know, just blows me away that, that, that you can do that. Um, and you can do it safely. And, but there's a lot of medical considerations. Um, let me just know whether I'm in time. How many more minutes do I have? Around one to two minutes left. Okay. Let me just go. Um, so the favorite aspects are the profound moments, you know, of my patients. Um, yes, I was in love as a younger person. Now I'm in love for, for also other reasons and in love with so many of my patients. My patients, some of the, one, one patient was 23. He had a brain stem cancer, inoperable, a fresh newlywed. He and his wife, I, I let them know I could not take this tumor out of the brain stem because it's brain cancer. I biopsied and it was brain cancer, which means no resection. This is where Dr. Jin comes in. No resection is going to help. I'm done. This is a molecular problem. Um, and I had to put in a shunt that drained fluid. And he did beautifully. I extended his life for quite some time. And what does he do? He's not angry. He buys gifts for everybody. The neuro ICU, myself, thanking us profusely uh, for all that we did. And that was 14 years ago, and I'm still telling that story. Um, and, and those moments are unbelievable. You know, um, every time I, you know, it, it's, it's wow. Um, What's my daily life, day in a life of a neurosurgeon? This is, uh, Anisha gave me homework. So, um, so a day in the life, it's never the same. I know I have to do these things, but I, and I can create an order. Uh, you know, I'll have clinic day, Monday, Thursdays. I'll have surgeries, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Uh, but then I have emergencies. Maybe a patient will come into clinic with cerebral spinal fluid leaking out. Well, then I have to take that patient right away that day. That clears, that changes my day. That may mean I'll say, hey, honey, I can't, I'm not coming home for dinner. I got to go do this. Um, so every day is a little different, but that for the person who is the adrenaline junkie, it actually works out. <laughs> so, um, and then I have my administration work as chairman looking at quality. Um, but, but I have regularity with a fair amount of uncertainty built around that. And I actually build my day so that I can build in uncertainty. How do you triage? First, I ask myself, is what I'm seeing damaging neural elements? What's the natural history of this lesion? How do I expect this lesion to treat this patient? Do I have time? And that's linked into natural history, the neurologic exam. And uh, is it a surgical lesion like that brainstem cancer? It wasn't a, it looked like a surgical lesion, but because I knew it was brain cancer infiltrating, it was not a surgical lesion to take fully out. It would have destroyed him more than help him. So I'm always weighing out the benefits of and risks. Um, I don't think we have time to go, but this is, you know, this is an MRI. Um, here, does this, does my pointer show on my screen? This is the lesion, right? Yeah. 
Um, this is the left side, right side. So R is right. Very important. Wrong-sided surgery can happen about once a week in the country. So we actually go through very careful safety measures to make sure we're always on the correct side. Um, and so this is the left side. Uh, it's quite anterior. Broca's is really about there, which is the speech. This is the angular gyrus, Wernicke, <clears throat> where you have receptive. That is the ability to understand speech. This is where my brother probably had issues, still does, in the Broca's area. He can't produce speech. <clears throat> so when I'm doing this surgery, I did this awake. Patient was talking, and my approach, when I analyze it, is coming from anterior, not posterior. I don't want to go through all of this cortex. That's bad, because this is all important cortex. So I'm always looking for the ineloquent area into the eloquent area. This ended up actually being an old hematoma. And with that, let me get to my conclusion. Cervical spine, like Dr. Jin said, this is spinal cord injury right here. He was quadruparetic. This is very cool. This is a trauma. And what I'm pointing at, I don't know if you can see it, but what I'm pointing at is a metal piece. This gentleman got stabbed in the skull and the knife actually went through the skull. I just saw Allison hang just jaw open her mouth. I did too. This is the first time I've ever seen this in my life. And this is why I love my field. It's never a dull moment. Um, so advice on becoming a neurosurgeon, another homework assignment by Anisha. And I think, you know, I think um, the more salient advice is probably how do I know I should pursue this? And I think you may never know till you actually join. One of the ways is to shadow a neurosurgeon or shadow people in medicine and say, you know what? I find this not intellectual enough compared to what Dr. Jin is doing which is all day thinking about all of these, you know, scientific principles. So some people will go more into neuroscience study. Some people just say, yeah, I want to fix that and I want to do it today, you know, and that may be more of the neuroscience or it may be a combination where you spend three days in the lab and two days in clinical. Um, that's another combination that you can do. Um, third year medical rotation. When you do this, you'll probably feel, wow, I got to do this. Otherwise, I'm going to regret it in my life. Um, Dr. John Tu, chairman, said, you know, he was a famous chairman in neurosurgery. And he said, when I was interviewing there, the water wears the stone, Molony. The water wears the stone. And it meant keep on keeping on. Keep doing it. Keep at it. Lots of things will come your way. Uh, it's a long Another, uh, my chief said, it's like being uh, uh, Vin, uh, uh, Rip Van Winkle. It's like you sleep through your nine years of residency. You don't even know what's going on around you in the world, you know? And you wake up to a world because you're so intensely learning neurosurgery. Um, and, and another resident said to me in terms of neurosurgery, he told me when I was thinking, when I said, I want to be a neurosurgeon, so many people discouraged me. How are you going to have kids? How are you going to have a, you know, how you, I think those are false choices. You can do it all, um, you know, and you could not have kids not doing neurosurgery, you know? And so, you know, to predicate your whole life, you know, I think if, if it, if it's there, great, you know, um, the other aspect is nothing else will do, you know, if you feel like, eh, I don't really want to do cardiology. Eh, I don't want to do that. Oh, I, mm, nah, nah, nah. And you keep saying that. And then you think about neurosurgery. Yeah, I want to do that. And then you, you're going to have to be sleep deprived and do it. Advice on having a great career. Be flexible and trust your instincts. You know yourself best. Your parents brought you up well. And now you're ready. You're ready to go out there. And trust you may start neurosurgery. Many people quit. Um, that's okay. That was their instincts. It wasn't right for them. And they went on to have great careers in other ways. I know one person who was a fifth year neurosurgeon female, and she just felt like, mm, no, you know, she ended up going into neuroanesthesia, one of the best at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and, you know, and, and had her life that way. So many ways, um, uh, to have that great career. Don't, Put yourself in one slot. Be, be
be open to learning from your experiences. So here's a little comic. Our interns work extremely long hours. The harnesses will keep them awake during your operation. Literally, I would lean against the microscope and take a little nap when my, when my chairman would operate, at, you know, and, and I would be post-call and exhausted. So it's actually true. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Norman. Thank you so much. I was actually, my brother and I, we were actually born at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually born there too. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> nice. It was called Boston Lying In at that time. All right. So now we'll move into approximately a half hour of Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. But before then, there's some, there were some like frequently asked questions that were in the uh, form that you guys signed up on. So I'll start by asking our two speakers some of those questions. Yeah, so the first question that was asked a lot was, what steps should a high schooler take to prepare for a career in neuroscience? This could be like programs, research, and then like kind of a follow-up since there's a pandemic right now, like is there any advice for pursuing neuroscience as a high schooler, like during the pandemic, maybe like virtually or online? Can I start this? I think yeah, the, Dr. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Um, I think the it's so great to hear you talk, um, Dr. Um, Narayami. That's how I pronounce your name, right? right? Yeah. Narayanan. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a remarkable that we both actually just share with the students um, that the um, we were actually overlapped at MIT. I was exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you were in the electric engineering and I was in the biology. So. Wow. Isn't that Are you kidding me? All right. No. So I, I, think I thought that, so. <laughs> so uh, in some ways it said that. Uh, and. Our career, I'm just sharing this with, this, with, the, um, with the high school um, students, is that we both said the same thing, is um, how do you prepare for neuroscience? The same thing, how do you prepare for any career? Is that um, fix it on one top. Neuroscience is a huge field, um, which can be anywhere from me working with a model organism in the lab and studying molecules with a tiny structure to neuroscience, like a surgeon, where you really have to think about how to um, cure the patients with a language that is um, rehab, retraining. All of this is, is to, to get you on the solid ground and gaining knowledge. and um, really uh, trust your instincts. That's the word I'm looking at here. It's very much mm -hmm. right. And not afraid to try different things. Actually, really encourage yourself to try different mm -hmm. things, right? You were engineering, and then you got, um, by not by design to become uh, going to medicine, and again, not by design to become a surgeon. And I was really thinking doing um, DNA um, engineering, and not by, de by design, I went to um, study model organisms that I actually did not know at all before when I was high school students. So that's, that's my point, is to... Um, Build a foundation. You know how to gain knowledge. You know how to evaluate um, the questions, the problems in front of you. You know how to get to um, other people, like your mentors, and particular mentors, to encourage you and to guide you um, to try out your ideas. Yeah, and 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 I think, Dr. Jun, one thing you know that I wanted to really sees how, how our paths got influenced by mentors and, um, you know, some of it, you know, maybe I'm getting wiser, you know, some of it is my will, some of it isn't, you know, some of it is kind of serendipity or, you know, um, just kind of this, um, you know, these people that came, you know, in, I think if Dr. Frim had not made it seem so accessible, you know? It felt like the ultimate, you know, kind of an ivory tower of, of 
you know, and, um, and it just, he just was very approachable. And so that really makes a huge difference. So it's important to know that if you really want to do something, but you're not feeling it, maybe you need to find that mentor. You know, maybe if you're in, so say your instincts say, I love this, you know, you know, and studying the worms or studying the neurons or studying neuroprotectants, you, you feel a calling, but, but it's just not flowing the way you thought it would. Um, maybe it could be that you just haven't found that right mentor. Um, you know, and um, so that's just something to. Um, yeah. And the other thing I think you all are doing also is to build your network and your peer group. And you learn a lot from each other and you absorb a lot of information. And in it's not like by design. It's just as you're thinking and you're questioning and you're learning, you will in somewhere you make that connection. That is actually incredibly important. This, this group that you're developing, because as you go in, you know, and advance, this is going to be a group you're always going to come back to um, if you keep it going. So um, it is very important. One of the main things is in residency, you're keeping in touch with your residents. Those residents become attendings, as in with Dr. Jin's colleagues, they're professors all over the country. Um, you know, and, and my husband, actually, Dr. Jin, is in molecular biology. Oh. Uh, we'll do it offline. Uh, Dr. Ramaswamy Iyer. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, it becomes an incredible uh, network for career advice, um, tough times, um, pivotal decisions. You know, that, that, um, that becomes key. Great responses from both of you. I really like how you kind of built off of each other. I think that was really cool. Um, the next frequently asked question was, how has COVID-19 impacted the field of neuroscience? This is a, a tough question um, to, uh, well, it's good to ask that. We're all struggling with um, the time delay, the social distance and the limited hours. Um, the impact is not easy to assess at this point by any quantitative meanings. But I think um, all researchers are doing their best to get engaged. Professors will, as you all taking uh, classes on Zoom and all professors are engaged in college education through online courses. Lab are open and um, people become more efficient. My own lab, uh, we use a Zoom as a way to uh, exchange information and share research progress. We keep in touch. Um, same thing throughout the country. Um, there are a lot of uh, international seminars. In fact, um, one of my colleagues at Stanford has had uh, every week uh, there's a seminar that he hosted called the Neuro Zoom Talk. It's one person from United States and one person from China, Japan, um, India, and Korea, anywhere so we can keep um, our science, uh, our brain active and start thinking ideas. We also do, um, we also start seeing a lot of, uh, you guys are very good on that, that is um, data analysis. Um, coming up with ways to quickly analyze data, collect data, and um, so I think the impact um, is um, there's a short term, definitely um, setback um, on everybody's careers plans because you lose time, but at the same time, and also keep the community together. Um, wow, I could, uh, it's a big deal. You know, I'm in a hospital. Um, and, uh, one of the hospitals I work at already have almost full capacity of COVID in the ICU. We're already, so, which means that we have to think about, um, you know, how we plan the electives. Um, so we have a task force for COVID, uh, at pretty much all the hospitals, you know, at the two hospitals and it's all, all over. 
um, where we're analyzing how to divvy up our resources. Um, you know, it was very intense when it came on. Um, we stopped all electives as Maryland mandate, uh, statewide mandate by the government governor to stop all electives. <clears throat> um, and so we we're only doing emergencies. And that meant even patients with cancer were getting delayed care. Um, this time around, we are, uh, that kind of directive is not there. Um, and we're going to try to see whether we can keep, you know, at least the higher end electives going. Personally, sure. I mean, you walk, you know, the first time around it, you know, you're walking into, um, you know, it, it was, um, you know, you don't, you, you know, you're having a lot of COVID everywhere. You have to be careful. We wear N95s um, pretty much, you know, and wash our hands. There's all sorts of stations. I think initially it was challenging because we weren't prepared for it. And I think now prepared meaning we as uh, healthcare workers were not used to that flow. And now we've gotten more used to it. PPE is a lot more um, and we have a lot more cleaning supplies. So I think it's a little different. Um, you know, this second surge um, that we're seeing. Um, and, uh, but, you know, telemedicine, I used to travel to India and, um, and I still do, of course, but I mean, when I would, I sometimes would go for three or four weeks and would want to do telemedicine with some of my patients, even though I had cross cover and other neurosurgeons covering, I still want to be in touch. And so I was navigating through this, joining a local telemedicine chapter, understanding it, um, because there's a lot of rules and stuff that you have to look at. And it exploded, and I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's great. I think um, there are many patients who can't make it to the clinic or can't make it everywhere all the time. And I think it's really going to benefit um, them in the long term. Um, so I think, I think there's great opportunity. Um, my own brain <laughs> has gotten used to the intimacy of Zoom. I feel like I'm hanging out with you guys. So it's really interesting. You know, if you did a functional MRI pre-COVID and you did a function and doing Zoom and you did a functional MRI post-COVID when you got used to Zoom, I'm sure the way our brains light up responding to Zoom is different. Um, so, so I do think you know, maybe there'll be some light at the tunnel and some real changes, but, uh, but sure, it's been, you know, I feel mostly for all of you because, you know, we've lit, we've got to do what we wanted to for a while. And for you, your lives got kind of, you know, at the peak of when you're supposed to be in college and high school and, and socializing, it's really having to uh, have a new life. Um, and you're really doing that sacrifice for the older people. Your morbidity and mortality is very low. You'll get COVID and you'll be fine. But you're doing, in a way, you're being asked to do this for all of us and patients who are older. So we thank you. Thank you so much. Those are really good responses. And I kind of gained a lot more insight into COVID and neuroscience. Uh, so another frequently asked question before we moved in, move into the questions in the chat. Uh, was what are some of the most interesting neuroscience uh, projects or experiments that you've seen or even taken part of like in the field of neuroscience? And then uh, why do you find them very interesting? That is very uh, personal uh, choice space. That is, um, we all have different training background. We all have different uh, focus. I would say um, almost everything I will read about neuroscience, I I find it interesting. So I probably, uh, in my field, and some in the chat box actually said this, the CRISPR technology, how it's, it's one um, certainly influencing not just neuroscience everywhere, and how to use this technology to speed up uh, advanced uh, basic science is very interesting it's so rapid almost like every day i can read about five or ten papers on it um there are also optic imaging um, microscopy and uh 
they uh, allowing you to see uh, live for longer time how neurons respond. I think the fMRI, and this probably is another <laughs> very, I just throw this uh, question and as a segue and go back to uh, Dr. Narayanan. Yeah, there, uh, so you're, you know, my interesting, so I've moved away a little bit from basic science, clearly going into clinical. Um, but when I was a resident, I loved uh, look, uh, one of the fields that we were looking at is neuroapoptosis. And, um, and we were doing a set of over-the-counter um, pharmacy medicines like promethazine and nortriptyline. And I would occlude the uh, carotid artery uh, in mice and um, create a stroke and pre-medicate with nortriptyline or promethazine. And we found greater than 50% reduction in the stroke, and it was a very significant. But it didn't make it clinically. See, and this is, this is my, you know, so I'm still waiting for my neuroprotectant, Dr. Jin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, yes. Well, we're all waiting for that. There's a, what will make it into clinically um, applicable yeah. and basic science will need it too. Um, yeah, neuroscience is that's why neuroscience is a very broad. It's not a simple one to say yeah. um, which one is exciting. It's it's what um, get you interest, right? Most. It's just fascinating. Um, the other aspect clinically is cranial cervical instability. That we we have a nationwide study. We're starting a randomized uh, trial. Um, and that is in connective tissue disorders. So their neck is super flexible. Uh, all their joints are. And what happens is that their cranial cervical junction um, uh, flexes too severely so that the top spine bone indents into the brainstem and can cause a constellation of symptoms. And that's called a cervical medullary uh, set of symptoms. So we're, we're doing a, a number of uh, clinical work to bear out what we're seeing in retrospective studies. Um, and um, so that is a very uh, fascinating, especially in Erlos-Danlos syndrome. Um, we're really, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a very fascinating, um, but also terribly painful um, disorder for the patients that have it. So um, so that, that's kind of on the real time right now that we're looking at. Thank you guys for the great responses. Um, now we're going to go ahead and go through the questions in chat. So I see a question. I'm interested in learning about gene expression in the human brain. What do you think I should start looking for information? And now I'm wondering where can we get internships or work in labs as high school students? The first question is uh, easier to answer. That is to say, um, there's many data, uh, open source, uh, open access data sources. For Brin, there's a clearly, uh, don't know how many of you know about Allen Brin Institute. This is located um, in Seattle. Basically, it's a um, place where it generates a lot of a single cell meaning the individual neuron sequencing data and physiology response and recordings, so some actually including from both human samples. Um, they can uh, use those data. This all online and all of you can access to it. And um, to get internship, um, that does take a lot of um, connections partly because the COVID, um, everyone has limited bandwidth, and as well as there's not the opportunity for on-site um, study. Many comes from designing remote study, and that does require a commitment from both sides. So it's not just simply internships, it requires um, the host site make, you know, device su sufficient um, topics to uh, get the project going. So the practical aspect to get internship is challenging, both for you 
when you write about you know hundred emails and you start wondering why they're not responding. And the same time, I receive about 100 emails. I'm going to have to say, which one I should respond? Am I able to? And do I have that capacity? So that is a practical matter that we all face. Good. I see somebody already posted the link, alleninstitute.org. Yes, absolutely. And there are also others um, start appearing such as um, CZI, you know, you know, this Chen Zuckerberg initiative also has cellular atlas and you go on to Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. They also have a data, there's NIH has many um, data sources. So really wanting to know, you will need some guidance and to access those data. For sure. Thanks, Dr. Jin. So uh, another chat question, I think Rupesh had a question that you put in chat. If you want to read it out loud, you can, or I can read it for you. Um, so I really enjoyed both of your uh, talks um, and I'm actually interested in the field of autism as well. Um, and but, uh, your information was really valuable. So I was wondering about this um, phenomenon that I had read about, about uh, neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. Um, and is there like uh, an effect that you can, um, like a way to induce this in the human um, brain? And uh, could this suggest like a possible cure or relief for autism? Is that directed at Dr. Jin or? or well, I, I think guess, Dr. Uh, Narayana, you, you have the expertise in that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there are no medications that speed up neuroplasticity. I think, um, well, autism is very complex because it's really a sign and symptom of many different, you know, um, I don't, I, I don't want to say necessarily disorder, but it's like a phenotype, you know, it, it's, it's just, it, it's got so many different causes that are a little different. You know, you have fragile X syndrome, um, and, and PAX-1 and, you know, there's just different. And then there's, uh, you know, no cause. Um, so, you know, I, I haven't really studied autism, interestingly, but whenever I read about it, I, you know, it, my sense is it's going to be more of a prevention um, or very early intervention. And, and I think, uh, but, but I, I just, I don't know the the recent literature on it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so the next question I see in chat is, both of you mentioned finding the right mentor and guidance. So I was wondering where we can reach out to find such guidance and mentors. Um, so, you know, it, it's networking, really. Um, you know, I didn't do the networking. I just got maybe lucky. Um, but I think you all are starting the network, like, you know, keeping in touch with us, for example, um, you know, and, uh, you know, it, and you develop this network of people, um, and, and then one of one or two of them, you really click with, or you work for, or you, you know, and I think that that's, that's how it, um, starts. Um, and, um, um, you know, usually we're limited to the university we're at, but there's also like, for example, in neurosurgery, there's national conferences. You know, there are two of them each year. And now with remote login, you don't actually have to travel all the way there. So I think our, I think you're in an unprecedented time of access, really unprecedented. I mean, all of these conferences are now you just WebEx into it. Um, and, and that's another way uh, to, to, you know, to find mentors. Also, uh, you know, I, I do have to put in, um, in terms of neurosurgery or medicine, I think as a woman, it is important to network or whatever, uh, you know, if you feel you have a certain diversity, you know, um, I think it is important to network, um, whether it's LGB, you know, LG, or it's, it's you know, um, you know, African-American or um, female or whatever it may be. Um, I think it is important 
to, uh, you know, I'm one in 450 neurosurgeon, female neurosurgeons who are board certified in the country, and there are 6,000. Um, and we have probably just a handful of chairmen uh, in the country um, that are women. So it starts to, you know, in terms of leadership, it starts to get less and less. And there's definitely a pyramid. Um, and that may be in many other, um, you know, and, there, and that has held true in, in Black Lives Matter. We've seen that come out as well. Yeah, I totally uh, agree on the building your through networking and to find uh, the right mentor. Often I uh, probably grew up in a way is that you pay attention, listening, actually listen. Being good a listener is a good way to find uh, the right advice. Often you go after the mentors usually have their track record. You can ask what their formal trainees say about this person. And never afraid and um, just uh, ask questions. Through ask questions, mentors will actually will approach you as well. So communication is an important step to find a mentor and to get advice. Thank you both so much. So um, we're a little bit over, but if you guys are still free, we can continue with the Q&A. Are you guys both good with that? I can go for another about um, yeah ten, yeah ten minutes, and I go have to start shopping and to get my daughter back. <laughs> yes, sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you guys so much. So um, another question in chat. Uh, this is more about like high school or college, and in relation to careers in neuro. So, what classes from your high school or college experience do you think most directly helped you today? Ah, um. That's really hard. <laughs> I enjoy the most classes. As it says, any classes inspired my, um, or in procured my imagination, I find them all useful. Um, I like, I think it's important to take notes. That's just me, how I learn things. And um, fundamentals, absolutely getting to a solid ground. Math is important, physics is important, chemistry. Um, but, um, Biology is a, a discipline, and particularly neuroscience, build on all of them. Oh, um, sorry. Let me just. Uh, um, I um, yeah. In high school, did you ask high school? Uh, it said high school or college. So okay, because high school I did not enjoy. <laughs> I mean, I got good grades. I probably skipped a month in my senior year, and uh, that was it. Check in and check out. Um, now, I did, when I went to a private um, high school my first year, it was great. And then I wanted to play a lot of tennis and, and try to go competitive. So I went back to uh, regular high school to create more time. So, but I blossomed also, in college, um, yeah, I did a lot. I mean, for neuroscience preparation, um, I definitely didn't. I did engineering um, in my undergrad. Um, you know, so I never quite, um, you know, I think basic science, it's so complex uh, in terms of neuroscience, you know, basic bench work laboratory. I think the more you can jump into it, um, the better. I think one aspect is also um, informatics is a big field. Um, and, you know, uh, at least my, from what I, you know, have through osmosis with my husband is, you know, informat, you do all these studies and then, you know, you need the informatics piece as well. Um, and so, you know, for these large, you know, genomics projects and, and stuff like that. So that's another very, which is computational math. And, and, um, so that's very important. Thank you. Nice. Um, okay. So the next question is, are there any known neurological effects on COVID-19 of COVID-19? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you can get strokes. There's a, what's called a procoagulable. We, we are believing that there's a procoagulable. That means your body has an increased risk of clotting. 
Um, and this can even happen uh, a few months after you've recovered. So you could either get clots in your lungs or your legs, which can cause what's called a pulmonary embolus, clots in the kidney, which can then cause infarction of the, ki of the kidney, um, and clots in the brain. Um, and so there is a little bit of that. So some are recommending in certain instances what's called anticoagulation, so blood thinners. Mm. Do you think that has something to do with inflammatory response? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it, it definitely doesn't help. Yeah. A lot of this disease is the body attacking itself in, in, um, through inflammation. All right. Um, Anisha, did you have a question, specific question that you wanted to ask? Yes. Uh, to Dr. Nadayanan, I was actually curious about the relationship between Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and mast cell activation syndrome and postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Lots of names I know, but if you could speak on that, maybe. Yeah. Well, scientifically, we don't know how it relates. So mast cell is when you have an over reaction of your mast cells, which is almost like an inflammatory um, disorder, can cause a lot of allergic reactions, um, headaches, visual blurriness, pain in your joints. It can be just, um, um, and, and, you know, one thought could be that uh, because of the, the connective tissue being, um, you know, at a, at a molecular level being, you know, different, um, that it creates this kind of inflammatory um, reaction with the mast cells. Um, but we don't necessarily have POTS. Um, it's a kind of an auto, it's a dysautonomia. And it may be as simple as the connective tissue being so stretchy that when the sympathetic ganglions are hugging the spine, uh, you know, there's a whole chain of sympathetics and parasympathetics. When they're hugging the spine, that it's stretching more, even the vagal nerve can stretch more and cause a lot of um, unnecessary firing of the parasympathetic or sympathetic. So that when you get up, your vasculature is not clamping down and you feel lightheaded or dizzy. And POTS stands for postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. So, and basically it's when you get up you have an ex you don't have the response to keep the blood pressure and perfusion to your brain. Mm. There's multiple reasons. Um, one is like I was saying about uh, the a new imbalance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic. Another one is in the spine. The vertebral arteries can sometimes get kinked by the hyperlaxity of the upper cervical spine, and that causes a hyperperfusion into the brainstem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so we have one more question. What keeps you motivated to pursue neuroscience? And what is the biggest reason you continue to pursue it today? I could say is anything that I'm feeling, I, I'm feeling learning, learning new things is what motivates me. And uh, I find uh, as new funding showing up and there's a lot more new things I need to learn, I think my motivation comes from just wanting to learn. Even in my stage, I teach um, college students and mentoring graduate students. They produce so many interesting questions for me to think about it, to get back to them and do my best. And that is what motivates me in my daily life. Yeah, I think, I think, and what I see in Dr. Jin as well, and what, what I feel is, you know, it's the discovery and it's, it's just fun. You know, there's a lot of aspects that's not fun in my job, like dictations and administrative and billing and da da da. <laughs> yeah, we all know that. <laughs> you know, right. You know, you know, payroll, blah, blah. But, but, you know, like this lecture, you know, just seeing those pictures, I was giggling, you know, um, seeing the knife go through the skull. I mean, at this point in my life to giggle over something like, you know, but I really was at 1am when I was in the OR, you know, 
he was perfectly okay. You know, he was talking with this knife stuck in his skull and taking him in and actually seeing it go through, um, you know, and just those little moments or that, you know, patient uh, that was so tragic, but it was so profound to be able to give testimony to their stories um, and to help in whatever way I can. So I think, I think the whole mix but if anyone ever wants to do my billing, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> there are daily aspects of it as a grown-up adult. So we will have to handle. I think that's important that you become eventually appreciate what your parents do for you. But there are also fun part that you provide a lot of, um, of thoughts, challenges for us to, to um, keep us um, going and to say what we can do to help you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're really the future, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm so excited. I can't believe how interested you guys are in neuroscience. I, you know, you're so young. I mean, oh. you know, and um, so it's, it's fantastic. And if you want to switch completely to something else, that's okay. This will not go to waste. You know, my intention is to use it, you know, to think about devices or to, you know, so it's the journey. And, uh, you know, I love the journey that you're on. I'd like to thank you all actually to put together this. And then um, I would never, uh, on the on inner cases, to share the stage with Dr. Narayanan. And actually, we are connecting. I mean, basically, we from totally different angles. And then we are saying the same. Right. We're learning from each other, too. Yeah. Oh, so, so true. I, I was like, wow. You know, and, and we don't have conferences. We do, but we don't, you know, it, it's right. different. Um, right. So you, um, you are indeed um, a, one very few uh, women neurosurgeon that I have uh, met and, uh, you know, very close. So see. Well, ditto. I mean, being a professor is a very big deal. Um, and uh, so it, it's really been a delight having this fellowship. I think we just networked. Yeah, we just started networking. <laughs> and we'll be keep uh, each other and then in the long run. And I actually <laughs> have a trip to Washington, D.C. sometime next year. So. Oh, hey, come yeah. on by. Right. We live in Rome. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, thank you guys well, all so much. Thank you for your time. And, and I gave out my email if anybody, you know, um, wants to get in touch with me. Um, I think Anisha has it, so you know, feel free and uh, we'll go from there. Yep. All right. Thank Enjoy the so rest much. of the weekend. Thank you guys so much. Happy too. Thanksgiving to everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank everyone. Happy We're so Thanksgiving. grateful for today. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for coming and thank you to our awesome speakers today.